Hey, everybody. We're going to um, commence, because um, I got 7 o'clock on, uh, on the dot, and so we're going to start, and as the people kind of leak in here, we'll just, that'll be fine, okay? Um, wow. Uh, this is amazing. Thank you uh, for the uh, response, and, and obviously we've hit kind of a little bit of, a, of an interest with Joshua Chamberlain. Um, and so I'm, I'm anxious to, to talk about him. And, and for all, I'm sure, okay, there's going to be some Joshua Chamberlain experts, Civil War experts uh, amongst us. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be one. Uh, I am not a historian. I'm not. I'm an engineer, okay? Engineer pays the bills, but history is my passion, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm thankful that you are all here tonight. Um, let me talk about a few things, kind of what I'll call our sponsors, if you will. The Oklahoma Military Heritage Foundation, if you didn't know we had one, we've got one, okay? Uh, they're an incredible organization uh, with a lot of volunteers who, are, who do a tremendous job, and they put on uh, a Hall of Fame, Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame induction ceremony uh, every year. Oklahoma's military heritage it's incredible. I didn't even, when I started kind of investigating them, they have a website um, and you can start going through and finding uh, just an incredible amount of people from Oklahoma that have gone and served and, and defended our freedoms going way back, okay? And they do a great job of preserving that heritage for us. Um, I think that's what is their passion, right? Is they're, they're trying to make sure that the next generation understands uh, what heritage and legacy they've been left. So they're there with a, with a heart to teach. Um, if you go down to the Oklahoma History Center, you can see um, some actual in-person stuff, but then you can also go online. There's videos. It's really, it's, they do an incredible job. And there's a couple folks here. Uh, if you want to talk to them later, they're right back there. You can talk. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, anybody else that I missed? Anyway, so there's yeah. four of us here. That's Outs yeah, outstanding. Um, and again, that website is, is tremendous. It's tremendous. Um, the other one that I want to talk about is Mission 22. Um, so Mission 22 is an organization that is meant to help veterans that are in crisis. Um, sad to say that we average about 22 veterans who commit suicide every day. Um, now, that's, that's worse than any war we've ever really been in in the last 20 years, okay? But it's kind of this silent war. Um, and so Mission 22 specifically goes and helps veterans, their families, and the community to help those veterans that are, that are in crisis so that it doesn't have a bad and tragic ending. And to that end... Uh, there's another project called Till Valhalla. Um, in fact, this is some of their shirts right down here. We're going to give these away at the end. Um, and this was started in 2017 by a vet. Uh, and they just make merch. Hats, shirts, stuff. And they sell it. And then their goal is then to convert that into hours of therapy. And then they also deliver memorials to families. It's like a plaque. And they go out and, and do an event. Um, with the families. So I would really encourage anybody to become familiar with those three organizations, the Oklahoma Military Heritage Foundation, Mission 22, and uh, Till Valhalla. And again, we'll give away some shirts. I got some other stuff down here. Uh, we'll give away at the end. Okay. So, Joshua Chamberlain. Um, Interestingly enough, I, I think he's the real Captain America, but my job tonight is to convince you, and you get to vote at the end if I did a good job, okay? So Captain America, pretty much everybody knows who Captain America is, okay? Um, the first one, the first comic book was actually published a year before Pearl Harbor in December of 1944. It just recently sold for $3.1 million, so I wish I had that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and here's the thing, 
So seven-year-old Greg Kent is in Mrs. Dumkrieger's class, uh, and the, she was tough, right? But we would go to the library, and we'd have an hour in the library, and in the back, in some of the stacks, there were all of these comic books that had been reproduced that you could sit there and read. And so seven-year-old Greg Kent, hey, even though I share a last name with another famous superhero, Captain America, Steve Rogers, got my attention, right? Um, and obviously, it's gotten other people's attention. I mean, the publication has run for over 80 years. And then you start looking at recently, right? Like, there's $2.2 billion just in Captain America movies in the last, since 2011. By the way, that drawing right there, I asked a seven-year-old who is the son of my boss. I said, okay, like, you give him a, you give him a pen and go, tell me about draw, draw Captain America. He didn't do too bad, right? With a dry erase marker. And then you go like, well, why do you, what, what, do you, what do you think of when you think of Captain America? He's awesome. Okay, I got that. So obviously, Captain America resonates, resonates with people, okay? And then I asked, just took an informal poll amongst my family and friends, and I said, okay, what, give me some top five reasons uh, that, that are impressed you with Captain America. Like, why? Like why? Uh, and you kind of get this list of five. You know, he's the underdog, right? If everybody knows the story, kind of a, a wimp to warrior story. Uh, he's selfless and loyal. What I converted that into was he has principles over his interests. He will do things that are not in his best interests, but they, they, they are for a higher principle. It's courageous. And then one of his famous lines is, is, is he's usually in battle and getting beat up. It's like, well, I can do this all day, right? So he's, it's perseverance. And it was a leader that you would want to follow, okay? But I hate to break it to you, right? It's all fiction. So in my view, when we step through here tonight, I'm going to tell you that my thesis statement is, is that Joshua Chamberlain is the real Captain America, and then you guys get to decide. Now, I will tell you straight up, this is, gonna, this is going to break every major rule of presentation that you've probably ever been given, because there's going to be a boatload of words up there. We're going to actually read uh, his words. He, um, his book, the, the guy was prolific. His book, Bayonet Forward, right here, uh, we're going to go right to him, and we're going to take some excerpts of what he says. It's not what I say, it's what he says. So he's here tonight telling us what he thinks. And then there's a really good biography uh, by Willard Wallace that was probably out of print now, but same way. So we're going to go and actually use his words to, to convince you of whether or not he's the real Captain America. Okay, so here's the background on him. Born September 8th, 1828, Brewer, Maine. Not an easy life. We think we have it hard. We have air conditioning, people. We have, we have indoor plumbing, okay? He had a speech impediment as a kid, uh, but he was the oldest of five siblings. Um, and what you'll see later is John and Thomas actually join him in the Civil War. Uh, he's got an interesting background. His grandfather's fought in the American Revolution. One was actually a sergeant at Yorktown when uh, Cornwallis surrendered to, to Washington. Uh, there was another that was a colonel of a militia in 1812. So he's got a whole history of military service behind him. And his father um, served in what was called the 19, or 1839 Aroostook War, uh, which was the U.S. and the uh, British were fighting over the main Canadian New Brunswick line. Like, where was the border? And so we had to throw down and figure that out. Um, his father, hard. It was hard on Joshua. Most of what you read, uh, he was, he was really, really hard on Joshua. Um, but maybe because he was the firstborn, uh, his mom, mom doted on him. Uh, his dad wanted him to go to West Point. Mom wanted him to become a minister, right? So conflicting, conflicting things that are going on in Joshua at an early life. He actually goes into uh, Bowdoin College. There's some pictures of it. There's him. Uh, he spent six months teaching himself ancient Greek and Latin. 
to pass the entrance exam. Okay, now again, let's back up. No phone, no electricity, no running water. He's out chopping wood to get through the night, probably, because I'm sure, you know, Maine, I don't know what the temperature is in Maine today, but, you know, they do winter the right way. Okay, so he, he learns Greek and Latin to get into Bowdoin College. He graduates in 1852, Phi Beta Kappa, and he gets multiple, multiple awards uh, in Greek, French, chemistry, astronomy. He ends up knowing, he ends up teaching nine languages when he's at Bowdoin. The guy is incredible. I, I don't know how you do that. And you look through that, right? So it's Greek, Latin, Spanish, German, French, Italian, Arabic, Hebrew, and Sira it's Aramaic. I can't pronounce that word, but it's Aramaic, right? So it's an ancient biblical text. So he graduates, and then he goes to the Bangor uh, Theological Seminary in 1855. Now, the other stuff that's going on in America about that same time, we have the end of the American, Mexican-American War, so the entire West is starting to open up. When you talk about Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, all of that's starting to open up. It's also interesting that on July 5th of 1852, Frederick Douglass, if you don't know who that is, um, Famous, very well-spoken, African-American, incredible writer who was uh, making a case for what he would call the hypocrisy of American slavery in 1852. Uh, and there was a border war starting in 1855. So this is what he's seeing. This is what he's hearing. This is what is going on in his world when he's in college and then going on to the uh, theological seminary. Uh, he then succeeds Calvin Stowe. Now, everybody knows who Harriet Beecher Stowe is, I hope. She and her husband were at Bowdoin College, um, and they actually went to the same church. Uh, the Stowes had a, had a store that uh, Joshua and his wife Fanny, we'll talk about her in a second, would, would go through. Um, and so he's getting to hear the opening lines of, of Uncle Tom's Cabin and what that meant for the American Civil War in the North. Okay, So he's starting to hear that, and that was then published March 20th in 1852, and he actually then takes over when um, uh, Calvin Stowe leaves. Uh, jo Joshua then moves into that position that he left, and he teaches every subject that Bowdoin College ever had except mathematics. He couldn't do long division. I don't know. But he, 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 do, he doesn't teach mathematics. So in 1855, and by the way, I know I'm giving a lot of background. Hang in there with me. In 1855, he marries Fanny, and they have five children. Of the five, two survive to adulthood. Um, their first in 1856, then they had an infant son that died in 1857. They, had a, they, have a, another, they have a son born in 1858 who survives, and then their last two children are, die in infancy. Okay? So by, but by 1861, like, Joshua Chamberlain's got it pretty easy. He's a full-time professor. Uh, he's getting paid good money. Bowdoin College likes him. He's married. You know, it's difficult because it's 1861, right? But generally, comparatively, he's got a very comfortable life. Um, but something's starting, to, something's starting to eat at him. Um, and he starts thinking about joining the, uh, the army. Now, again, in 1861, right, so we've started, the, the Civil War is on. All the stuff's starting to come back. He's hearing uh, real time of what's occurring. Now, his wife is like, no, I don't want you to go. Go figure. I, that makes sense. She doesn't want him to go to war. Um, she's got two kids she's got to take care of, right? Who's chopping the wood? Who's taking care of? Who's, who, how are we earning a living here? The college definitely doesn't want him to go because he's their star professor. And as would, you would expect, what does he do? He writes a letter to the governor. He writes a letter to the governor. I'm going to read this. I have always been interested in military matters, and what I do not know in that line, I know how to learn. 
Having been elected to a new department here, I'm expecting to have at the approaching commencement to spend a year or more in Europe in the service of the college. So they're going to pay for him to go to Europe, take the whole family to Europe. I am entirely unwilling, however, to accept this offer. If my country needs my service or example here, Your Excellency, that was the governor, governor was in charge of the military and all the university system. Your Excellency presides over the educational as well as the military affairs of our state, and I'm well aware, appreciates the importance of sustaining our institutions of learning. You will therefore be able to decide where my influence is most needed. But I fear this war so costly of blood and treasure, I'm going to pause there, this has only been going for a year, right? It's, it's 1861. Like, the worst of the Civil War is well in front of them. But I fear this war so costly of blood and treasure will not cease until the men of the North are willing to leave good positions and sacrifice the dearest personal interests to rescue our country from desolation and defend the national existence against treachery at home and abroad. This war must be ended with a swift, strong hand, and every man ought to come forward and ask to be placed at his proper post. Okay, so his interests, all of his interests, are not to go. But his principles are saying, you got to go. And he goes. On August 29th of 1862, they actually offered him a full colonelcy to be in charge of a regiment. He says, no, I don't want to be in charge of a full regiment. I want to be second in command because he doesn't know anything. So incredibly humble move on his part because he could have walked out with all the regalia and said, hey, I'm, I'm the man. I'm in charge here. And they just would have walked into a mess. But he chooses to uh, join the 20th Regiment Inf- Infantry, main volunteers. His brother Thomas, that's the picture in the upper right, join him. So his brother is in the regiment with him, and he gets this guy named Colonel Adelbert Ames, first class of uh, West Point, of first, class, first West Point class of 1861. They had two classes that year, go figure. They sped up the second one. They graduated one in May and I think one in July because they needed officers on the field. But he earned a Medal of Honor uh, for first bull run or first Manassas. Now... They get 900 men from all over Maine, and they don't know anything, nothing. Uh, May, Adelbert, Colonel Ames there, uh, calls them a hell of a regiment because they're a mess. In fact, when they put ashore at Washington, D.C., these guys have no drill experience. They're farmers, they're fishermen, they're loggers. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so they attempt at marching, and it's written in, in Joshua's uh, journal that people howled at them. They laughed at them. Here are all these guys. They can't keep step. They're just a mess. Um, and uh, Colonel Ames was embarrassed, had a little shame. Uh, his, his conclusion was it would be better for them to just desert right now and go home because this, is, this, is, this isn't going to work. But Colonel Ames is a disciplinarian. He's, he's tough. Um, at one point, Thomas, the upper right, thought that somebody might accidentally shoot him. Because he was, he was not the most popular in the regiment. However, this is where the brilliance of Joshua Chamberlain comes in. He's learning the whole time. And what you see in some of his biographies and other people is that as soon as everybody went to bed, Joshua was in with Adelbert, learning everything that Adelbert Ames had to teach him uh, from West Point. So they would burn the midnight candle way late in a tent to learn everything, and it pays off. Now, here's, here's the first time they, they end up kind of getting bloodied, and, and here's where I'm going to go really fast. We could talk about Fredericksburg and Gettysburg and Petersburg and Chancellorsville. There are people that get their entire history PhD by pulling apart those battles. I'm going to go really fast. Um, I would recommend you go do some more research on it, okay? And this is where I, Fredericksburg, I figured out who Joshua Chamberlain was, okay? Because I walked the battlefield, and I started figuring it out, and you start seeing things, and you start listening to what that battlefield will tell you throughout history. So, Fredericksburg, uh, for a real brief overview, 
is uh, it's uphill. There's this stone wall. You can kind of see it in, in the picture. There's a stone wall called Marie's Heights, and then there's a trench behind it. So, so everybody could stand in the trench and fire over the stone wall from near perfect prote protection. And they would be stacked three deep. So you could shoot one bullet, uh, well, you could shoot three bullets in about a minute if you were really, really good. And so you would stack everybody three deep. And so the first guy would fire, and he'd start reloading, and the guy right behind him would fire, and he'd start reloading, and the third guy would fire. And by the time he'd fired, the first guy was reloaded and ready to go. Okay? And so General Burnside, who is the commander of the Union at that point, feeds everybody in piecemeal. So instead of everybody going in and kind of using the concept of mass and taking over in one big fail swoop, he puts them in kind of regiment by regiment and allows the, the Confederates that are up on Marie's Heights to just pick them apart. Um, and you can kind of see, where you see it says Hooker right there, General Hooker. That was the Central Grand Division. And we're gonna, he comes back up here in just a second. And so you can kind of see another picture of a painting of kind of what it looked like as they're trying to go up this hill um, to assault Marie's Heights. Now, <clears throat> they get stuck out there. And because they weren't supposed to spend all that much time out on the battlefield, where do you think they left all their cold weather gear? Back in the city with all the gear. So they go up, they run up the hill, and then they get stuck up there, and a cold north wind comes in that night. And he actually covers himself with bodies for warmth and protection. So he builds, out of, out of dead Union soldiers around him, he builds kind of a, a place to stay safe. And I'm going to go back, and we're going to listen to what he says. And I'm going to read this. Now we reached the lines we were to pass for the farther goal, and we picked our way amid bodies, and, and this, this gets a little gruesome, but it, it's what happened. Uh, amid bodies thickly strewn, some stark and cold, some silent with slowly ebbing life, some in sharp agony that must have voice, though unavailing, some prone from sheer exhaustion or by final order of hopeless commander, the living from their close-clung bosom of earth strove to dissuade us. So they're, they're marching, and there's dudes laying around going, stop, and they go, okay? And, it, and, and he has fellow Union soldiers yelling at him going, it's no use, boys. We've tried that. Nothing living can stand there. It's only for the dead. That's out of his journal. Um, and he goes on to describe what it was like as he continued up, uh, up towards Marie's Heights. And he gets stuck. So on we pushed, up slopes slippery with blood, miry with repeated unavailing tread. We reached that final crest before that all-commanding, countermanding stone wall. Here we exchanged fierce volleys at every disadvantage until the muzzle flame deepened the sunset red, and all was dark. We stepped back a little behind the shelter of this forlorn, foremost crest and sank to silence, perhaps such as human weakness, to sleep. They all fell asleep. They had exerted so much to go up this hill. They had been in this battle back and forth with the Confederates. They fall back into this kind of swale where they can hide out, and they just fall asleep as the sun's going down. Um, he continues, For myself it seemed best to bestow my body between two dead men among the many left there by earlier assaults, and to draw another crosswise for a pillow out of the trampled blood-soaked sod, pulling the flap of his coat over my face to fend off the chilling winds, and still more chilling, the deep, many-voiced moan that overspread the field. So what he's saying there is as he's laying there, he can hear everybody. Like, and, and you guys can come down and look. I've got some bullets from, from the Civil War. Um, not high velocity. They would hit, kind of ricochet around, and then people would be stuck there. Um, and that's where you had people that would have broken bones from a, from a bullet, whatever. And so what he's saying is, is he could hear all these people out on the battlefield. The situation was critical. We took warrant of supreme necessity. We laid up a breastwork of dead bodies. Now all of his guys, he's teaching all of his other guys to do the same thing, to cover the exposed flank. No man could stand up and not be laid down again hard. I saw a man lift his head by the prop of his hands and forehands, 
forearms and catch a bullet in the middle of his forehead. Such recklessness was forbidden. We lay there all the long day hearing the dismal thud of the bullets in the dead flesh of our life-saving bulwarks. That's gruesome. That is gruesome. And that's Joshua Chamberlain. And so as I'm walking Fredericksburg and I've, I've kind of got a sense of who Joshua Chamberlain, I just stand there. And I'm looking at Marie's Heights and I'm like going, I don't know how anybody did that. But they did. Um, so then it's time for him, like it's failed, right? Uh, Burnside's attack on Fredericksburg has failed. Um, they've got to get these guys off. So anything almost worse then attacking up a hill is trying to retreat off of one. Um, so he writes, we had to pick our way over a field strewn with incongruous ruin, men broken and torn, cut to pieces in every indescribable way, cannon dismounted, gun carriages smashed or overturned, ammunition chests flung wildly about, horses dead and half dead, uh, still held in harness. And he goes on. And then he comes across General Hooker. I said the Hooker will, will show up here in a little bit. General Hooker, he's, he's, off the war, he's off the battlefield. General Hooker comes by. He's, it's in the rain. He's leaning against a tree and gave a kindly greeting to Joshua Chamberlain after he has successfully removed himself from the field at, at Fredericksburg. You've had a hard chance, Colonel. I'm glad to see you out of it. I was not cheerful, but tried to be bright. It was chance, General. Not much intelligent design there. And General Hooker replies, God only knows I did not put you in. And Joshua Chamberlain replies, that was the trouble, General. This is the Lieutenant Colonel talking to the commanding general of the Central Corps. You should have put us in. We were handled in piecemeal on toasting forks. It was plain talk, and he did not reprove me. In other words, General Hooker went, uh, yeah, you're right, and uh, I'm leaving now. Okay. So, so, that's the end of Fredericksburg. Now, you can, again, we're going to go fast because I'm already looking at the time. Okay? We're going to go fast. Look up Fredericksburg. Take a moment to understand that part of your American heritage. It's incredible. Joshua Chamberlain is one of many. Okay, so between Fredericksburg and Gettysburg, there's this huge battle called Chancellorsville. They're not in it. Uh, they, had a small prox, they had a smallpox outbreak after they come off the field at Fredericksburg, uh, somebody did not mix the serum quite right. They got a bad batch of vaccine, and everybody got sick. Um, the regiment was quarantined. They kind of stuck them off trying to guard some telegraph lines. But because of the, of the officers that have been killed, General Ames gets promoted. Joshua Chamberlain is promoted to colonel, and he assumes command of the regiment on June 23, 1863. Okay, So from June 26th, to July 2nd, the 20th Maine marches 122 miles in from Virginia to Gettysburg. Now, mind you, uh, these, these aren't the Brooks shoes and the nice boots we have today. Everybody got the same boot. <laughs> and there wasn't a left and a right. It was just a boot. Okay? And so they're marching 19, 20, 25 miles a day. Um, and we'll talk about that. But Colonel, J, uh, Colonel Chamberlain acquired a reputation during the war of being a severe disciplinarian, but one who was also just, who looked after his men, who shared their hardships, who expected no feat of courage that he was not ready to participate in or even lead. The result was that he had a magnificently trained and loyal command, and it happens just in time. Okay, Gettysburg. Gettysburg is the high watermark, probably someone would argue, for the Confederacy. Lee has invaded Pennsylvania. They need supplies. Virginia has been wiped clean. Uh, they've got to get north, and they need to try to get some uh, international recognition of what's going on. So they move north. Now, that all happens kind of July 1st. I'm skipping all day one of Gettysburg. Joshua Chamberlain is still far away from the battlefield, and they march in, and they assume, let's see, where's the, they're at the far end, you see where it says little round top, they get there 10 minutes before the flanking attack starts for, from Longstreet. So if you see, 
what you constantly tried to do in military tactics was hit the flank. You wanted to hit the flank, always. So Longstreet goes all the way around the end, and he's trying to get into the flank of the Union so he can roll it up, right? Joshua Chamberlain, the 20th Maine, get to Little Round Top. They are the far left of the Union flank. And they get there. They don't even have time to catch their breath. The attack begins about 10 minutes after they get there. Now, if you talk about the commander of the 15th and 47th Alabama, they had to stop to get water. They had marched nine hours straight. The two Alabama, division, two Alabama regiments had, had marched nine hours straight to get there, and they were 10 minutes late. So that's how it came down, how close it was. So they're marching up Little Round Top. Little Round Top, pretty steep incline. And he writes in his, in his book, at that fiery moment, three brothers of us, you got John, you got Thomas, and you got Joshua. John, on the left, belongs to the Sanitary Commission, which was like an early version of the Red Cross. So he is the guy taking care of the wounded. Thomas is a regimental, regimental adjutant, so he's a sergeant. And you have Joshua. And they're all riding abreast, and they're getting up the hill, and a solid shot driving close past our faces disturbed me. He said, boys, I don't like this. Another such, another such shot might make it hard on mother. So he sends all his brothers kind of away from him so that if, if one of them's killed, they're not all three killed at the same time. Reaching the southern face of Little Trump, Round Trop, I found Vincent there. That's strong Vincent. He's Joshua Chamberlain's commander, brigade commander, with an intense poison look. And he said with a voice of awe, as if translating the tables of the eternal law, I place you here. This is the left of the Union line. Do you, I mean, you understand? This, you're, you're it. You're, you are to hold this ground at all costs. I did understand full well, but had to learn more about costs. I had more to learn about costs. Okay, so the 20th Maine is on the extreme left of the Army of the Potomac. They're at half strength. So you went through Fredericksburg, you start out with 900 guys, maybe 1,000, but say 900. They go, through Chan- they go through Fredericksburg. They go through a smallpox uh, disease. They end up, by the way, uh, health, healthy food, healthy water, clean water, not in abundance. So you had people constantly getting sick from malaria, dysentery, all sorts of stuff. So they're at about half strength. And within 10 minutes, they get hit. And then Joshua Chamberlain does something really smart and kind of non-textbook. He, normally, you would be three rows back. You'd have three rows of guys. Okay? But he can't defend the flank if you're three, if you're three ranks deep. So he extends and puts everybody in a single file line, extending the line, but now you can't keep up your rate of fire as well. So you're putting your, you're putting your people at, at, at danger for that. So it becomes the, the rank becomes more shallow. And he, and he says, now, let me back up for a little bit. The southern regiments, 15th, 47th Alabama, have attacked and attacked and attacked, and they keep coming, and they keep pushing, and they keep going around the flank, and Joshua Chamberlain and his guys keep moving to the left, keep moving to the left, and they just keep getting um, attacked. And so this is turning into a war of attrition, right? Uh, If a strong force should gain our rear, you kind of see right there where 20th Main, he, he, he has it curved, so if they get to the rear, uh, we would be caught by a mighty shears blade and be cut and crushed. This must not be. So our orders to hold that ground had to be liberally interpreted, and they did something very quickly and coolly. And he gives all of his credit to the captains that, that were underneath him. They had to keep the front fire the hottest, and then gradually in one rank, they extend the whole line. And it was a very difficult maneuver because you're getting shot at the whole time. And he writes, I will never cease to admire and honor them for what they did in this desperate crisis. Okay, so they're they're running out of ammo. They're at half strength, and they've already lost people. And so now, too, our fire was slackening. Our last rounds of shot had been fired. 
Now, I'm sitting here thinking, and, and he describes other parts of the battle, but I'm thinking if I'm Joshua Chamberlain and I'm looking out and I'm like, guys are looking at me and going, I'm out. And you're looking at them going, okay, and what are we going to do? Um, they had fired their last cartridge, turned anxiously towards mine for a moment, and then square to the front again. To the front for them lay death, to the rear what they would die to save. And that's a picture of Little Round Top, of kind of where they were in Scott, kind of grouped up behind some of the rocks. So he has only one real option. And at that point, brave, warm-hearted Lieutenant Milcher, who was the color guard, color company, he's the guy in charge of the American flag, and whose captain and nearly half of his men were down, came up and asked if he might take his company and go forward and pick up one or two of his men left wounded on the field and bring them in before the enemy got too near. And with a glance, he understood, and I answered, uh, yes, sir, in a moment I'm about to order a charge. Five minutes more of such a defensive and the last roll call would sound for us. Desperate as the chances were, there was nothing for it but to take the offensive. He goes on, he says, one word was enough, bayonet. So they're out of, they're out of uh, ammunition. This is a bayonet. They fix bayonets. This goes over the top of the, of the muzzle of the, of the weapon, um, muzzle loader. They fix it, and now they stand ready. The men were up, were to it with a shout. One could not say whether from the pit or the song of the morning star. And he starts writing eloquently here. The whole line quivered from the start. The edge of the left wing rippled, swung, tossed among the rocks, straightened, changed curve from scimitar to sickle, and the bristling archers swooped down upon the serried host, down into the face of a half a thousand. So he's taking about 200 people, 200 guys that are left on the field, and they're attacking about 500. And what they do is they attack down a hill with bayonet as the 15th and 47th Alabama are trying to come up the hill. And he sweeps the field. They capture the 15th and 47th Alabama, um, and they, they literally sweep them all the way back in front of the other, the other regiments, like to the 16th Michigan, the 44th New York. They actually come down, and that whole, you see the little, Right, the little blue line that kind of looks at the 20th Main, that whole thing swings down like as a hinge and pushes them all in front of the other, other Union regiments. Uh, so then he has to tell, he takes a bunch of prisoners um, that are being guarded with, by guys that don't have any bullets in their gun, but they're prisoners nonetheless. And so he kind of makes a joke of like, well, it's only important that we know that. The prisoners don't need to know that. Um, and he recalls his regiment back to reinforce the Union left. So he brings everybody back to where they started from. Now this is, what, this is in his Medal of Honor citation, and we don't talk about it. If, if you watch the movie Gettysburg, they do a great job of recreating that charge. But what we don't know is, after Joshua Chamberlain, um, after they successfully do the charge, they bring everybody back, it's not over. Like, the day's not over. He still doesn't have ammunition. He still only has about 200 guys. And so they go over and secure big round top. Right? So you see little round top. They've swept the 15th and 47th Alabama off. They recover, and now they go to the big round top. And they march up at about 9 o'clock at night. They march so it's dark. No bullets, no ammunition, bayonet. And they go and they push everybody up there that's a Texas, 4th Texas, off the top of Round Top, and then they skirmish intermittently to deny Big Round Top as an artillery platform that saves the Union left. And then he remains in command of that throughout the night until he's relieved at 9 a.m. the next morning, and then he's retired to the center of the Union line to relax, and that's when Pickett's charge happens. Um, so he ends up right back in the, the heat of it the, f the following day. Now, remind you, these guys have marched 122 miles in nine days, and they still are able to pull that off. Um, I personally think, you know, it's amazing the charge, but to then be able to get everybody back organized, settle everybody back down, and then take bayonet and go to big round top um, is, is even more incredible.
Um, like when you would say, I can do this all day, he did it all day. Um, okay, and by the way, that's his, that's his after actions report. So for any of the military in here, handwritten three pages. That's a beautiful after actions report. That was his writing to the adjutant in Maine of what happened. Uh, he gets sick after that. He's actually wounded. He gets sick. Um, he's placed on leave, has a, has a bad bout of malaria. Um, but then he returns in 1864 uh, early and then is assigned as a brigade commander. Um, and then siege of Petersburg. Now we're going to go really fast. He's been asked to attack a fort called Fort Hell. Now, I don't know about you, but... <laughs> If I'm being asked to attack something, I don't really want to attack anything named that. Um, and as he's attacking, he's on a horse, and it gets shot out from underneath him by a cannon shot. His entire color guard is killed. So he picks up the, ch the colors and the Maltese cross. That was the brigade flag. And he urges everybody forward. Um, and he writes, it was, it was a case where I felt it was my duty to char lead the charge in person and on foot. At that point, he's, he's, he's kind of risked death multiple times, and he gets shot. There's a mini ball, which I have one down here. It's, a little, it's about that big around, just a little ball. Comes through his right hip, rattles around a little bit, uh, nicks his bladder, and then exits his left pelvis. Should be a uh, death, should be death. Um, but he props himself up on a saber. He can't move his legs. And he continues to direct uh, the attack forward until he passes out from loss of blood on the field. All the doctors expect him to die. General Grant promotes him to Brigadier General on the spot. I mean, this guy is the hero of, <laughs> the hero of Gettysburg. Promotes him on the spot to Brigadier General. Only time that's ever happened. Uh, the army then, in, in army fashion, as sometimes will occur, releases his obituary. <laughs> Which, when he was 85, uh, he liked to show that, and he kept that newspaper. Right. Anyway, he's evacuated from Petersburg. He has eight stretcher bearers and three surgeons, because this is the hero of Gettysburg. They put him on a stretcher and move him 16 miles by foot to City Point, Virginia to get on the USS Connecticut to go back to the Naval Academy Hospital. So the Navy does take care of the Army every now and again. And he recovers, okay? He recovers in Washington, D.C. Fanny comes down. She's there to help him, right? And what does Fanny think? Okay, you've done your, you've, you're done. That's enough, right? That's enough. You're done. I mean, he is near death, um, urges him to resign from the Army, he ends up getting a ton of offers from private business, like good offers, uh, but he refuses. Um, and he, he, that wound ends up, he ends up having multiple surgeries through the rest of his life. It also ultimately was a surgery to help that wound that ended up causing his death when he was 85. So 50 years after the fact. He returns to the army. He actually walks away from the hospital. He's not really discharged, he just leaves and walks, catches a ride, and joins the spring of 1865 campaign, um, which is the White, White Oak Road and Five Forks. And what you've got is you've got this huge push now to dislodge Lee from around Richmond. He's wounded again, nearly has his arm um, amputated. Uh, the only thing that really saved him was this huge book of uh, field orders that was really, really thick, full of paper, and it deflected the bullet. So again, I guess uh, administration saves. Um, and he gets so far forward of the lines that he's surrounded by a bunch of Confederate infantry, and he then pulls out a southern drawl and says, y'all follow me now, we're going to attack from here. And they do, and they take them all prisoner. Um, so he pulled out his he pulled out his theater he pulled out his theater uh, and 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 avoided capture by impersonating uh, Confederate officers. In the end, uh, it forces Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia to evacuate Richmond and Petersburg. They're they're trying to break out. This is it. The, the the Army of Northern Virginia is at its last gasp. 
and he's breveted to Major General. Now, what that means, I don't know if everybody knows what breveted means. It means you get uh, the rank and not the pay. So you get all the responsibility, but, but none of the pay that goes with it. And he ends up at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th of 1865. And so that's where Grant takes the surrender of Robert E. Lee, and the Civil War ends there. Of which he writes, uh, was one for which I sought nor authority nor asked for forgiveness. So he's, he's, he's going to do his thing. Before us in proud humiliation stood the embodiment of manhood. These are the Confederate soldiers that he's been fighting for the last four years. Men whom neither toils and suffering, nor the fact of death, nor disaster, nor hopelessness could bend their resolve, standing before us now, thin, worn, and famished, but erect and with eyes looking level into ours, waking memories that bound us together as no other bond, was not such manhood to be welcomed back into the, a union so tested and assured. He brings his entire division to attention to accept the surrender of General Gordon from the Army of Northern Virginia. On our port, not a sound of trumpet, so there's no cheering, no, ro no, no uh, rubbing it in. Uh, on our part, not a sound of trumpet more, nor roll of drum, not a cheer. Nobody cheered. Not a, nor word, nor whisper of vainglory, nor motion of man standing again at the order, but an awed stillness, rather, breath-holding, as if it were the passing of the dead. General Gordon, Army in Northern Virginia, called Chamberlain one of the knightliest soldiers of the Union Army. And what you see up there is General Gordon is on the left and General Chamberlain is on the right. General Grant gave General Chamberlain the honor of receiving the surrender of all of the Confederate forces. Okay. So, aftermath. He fought in 20 battles, lots of other skirmishes, encounters. He was cited for bravery at least four times. He had six horses shot out from under him. <clears throat> he was, had major wounds of, in action six times. Um, and what's interesting is he was offered a position in the post-war regular army, but he declined, and he returned to Maine. And for the rest of his life, he supported a lot of veterans programs. There was no VA, right? It was probably the best they had was the local church to support the veterans. Uh, that, that were coming home. These are guys that are, that are wrecked. They can't, they don't have a, an ability to even support themselves from a, from a job perspective, especially if you're going to Maine. You're not going to be logging, farming, fishing, right? Um, so he helped support veterans and family pensions for the rest of his life, but he, he sacrificed his family and his health. Um, John, his brother, uh, died from disease that he acquired on the battlefield trying to be uh, a member of the Red the version of the Sanitary Commission, the Red Cross. Thomas uh, had struggled post-war greatly, um, really struggled, had a lot of demons left over from the Civil War, as you can probably imagine, um, and ends up uh, uh, having an alcoholism issue and then struggling uh, with cancer later in his life. And then Fanny and Joshua struggled. Joshua struggled with, with uh, having survived the Civil War the rest of his life. But this is what he writes. We were fighting for our country with all that it, this involves, not only for the defense of its institutions, but for the realization of its vital principles and declared ideals. The crisis marked not merely an incident of time, but a momentum of force in the nation's life. The fight to preserve it from destruction has a historical, if not moral, value which should not be lost sight of. I am not in sympathy with any movement or proposition which would deny or obscure or ignore that fact. He is fighting, he fought, he gave for the values and the ideals and the moral ideas of the United States. And this he continues to write, fighting and destruction are terrible. Yeah, no kidding. But are sometimes agencies of heavenly rather than hellish powers. Pause, this is a guy that had gotten his degree as a minister from the Bangor Theological Seminary. Uh, in the privations and sufferings endured well, as in the strenuous actions of the battle, some of the highest qualities of manhood are called forth. Courage, self-command, sacrifice of self for the sake of something held higher. 
wherein we take it chivalry, finds its value, and on another side, fortitude, patience, warmth of comradeship, and in the darkest hours, tenderness of caring for the wounded and stricken of that of gentlest, gentlest womanhood, which allies us, allies us to the highest personality. What he's saying there is they found themselves, the highest version of themselves, when they were caring for people that were wounded. What we had lost and what we had won had passed into the nation's peace, our service into her mastery, our worth into her well-being, our life into her life. So he gave his life so that the United States could have life. Okay, so now it's decision time. We just covered four, we just covered four years of the Civil War at rapid pace, and I'm watching the time, okay? To me, Joshua Chamberlain, like, is Joshua Chamberlain the real Captain America? If you look at what Captain America, the ideals of Captain America, what he stands for, okay, is Joshua Chamberlain the real Captain America? What would you say? Yeah, absolutely. So that's my thesis statement. And what's interesting is Captain America is fiction. It's, it's, it's a thought. It's a creation of a couple dudes in 1940. Okay? Joshua Chamberlain is fact, and we know what he wants us to know because he left us his books so that he could, we could understand him in the future. And let me, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wax poetic just a little bit here, but there are some histories that are more important than others. Okay? The history of the pencil. Okay? Great. The history of the steak knife. I like steak. Is not as important as the history of people like Joshua Chamberlain or others. There's a thousand others, okay? Um, they are real pap people who sacrificed to secure and defend freedom, and it will require defending again. Their legacy is our responsibility. They, and I say that in a couple ways. One, to maintain their legacy so that people know who Joshua Chamberlain and everybody else like him, I could, I could go through a huge list. It's our responsibility to, to remember those, those folks that, that went before us. It's also our responsibility to take care of the things that they left us. Like, it's our country. He's not here now, right? So we have to be engaged. We have to be engaged in the right way to defend our country. And that doesn't mean you have to wear a uniform, okay? But their legacy is our responsibility. And it's interesting, George Or Orwell, I didn't put his name up there. I don't like George Orwell, he freaks me out. <laughs> but he writes, he says, those who control the present control the past, and those who control the past control the future. Okay? So we have to defend our future, we need to understand our past. Joshua Chamberlain is just one member of that past. But there's a whole bunch of lessons and inspiration and people that are out there waiting to be discovered. Um, and it's not that hard. I am not a historian. I just read, okay? I'm not, I'm not a historian. Um, but thankful, like people like the Oklahoma Military Heritage Foundation, I can just go on the internet and go, cling. There's a Vietnam ace that lives in Edmond, shot down five enemy airplanes. He lives here in Edmond, right? There is, an, there is a, um, family named the Ransbottoms that are from Edmond. He was uh, killed in action in Vietnam at a place called Cam Duck. He was MIA for 35 years. His mom got a telegram from the War Department, from the uh, United States Army on Mother's Day, 1968, to tell him, tell her, hey, we're not sure what happened to your son yet. And she sat there for 35 years until the United States went back seven times, eight times, and, and brought that man home. And he's buried here in Edmond. And his story is held at the Oklahoma Military Heritage Foundation. It's our responsibility to take care of the legacy that Frederick Ransbottom left us, or Joshua Chamberlain, or Hal Moore, or innumerable ones, Pat Garrison, innumerable ones that have left those, that legacy for us. Okay. So that, in 55 minutes, 
is the real Captain America. So I want to give away some stuff. Where's the, Lydia, can you go grab the? What year did he write his book? Uh, there's parts of it that he wrote within about three years of the Civil War that he, they, like he transcribed his journals. And then there's some other stuff. He went on a huge speaking thing like uh, in 1880. And so he has other stuff. And the story gets better sometimes the longer, the further away you get from the moment. But yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty contemporary to when he did it. All right. So here's what I got. Uh, Mission 22. This is Til Valhalla. This is Til Valhalla. And then there's a kid's one out there, too. I got, I got a bunch of big ones, kid one. And then I've got a couple, and I got a thing of stickers. If somebody wants to throw some stickers on a computer or whatever. All right? Here you go, boss. You need to. This is for the adult? Yeah, we'll just go left to right. Kelly Z-A-C-H-G. Sweet! <laughs> All right, pull another name. Kelly, Kelly is uh, part of the Oklahoma Military Heritage Foundation. Heather Book. Hey! You bet. There you go, Gabe. You bet. Save me some steps. Yeah, please. I'm sweating up here. Phil needs to work for him. He's a good kid. <laughs> Ryan Carlin. Yeah, there you go. Hey, you're, you're walking out with merch. It's good. Daxton Carter. There you go. Thanks, Absolutely. All right. Last one. I got it. I got stickers. Oh, yeah. John Abdomani. Ab Abdomani. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Good question. Thanks. Okay, that wraps this up. Now we have about maybe five, ten minutes if somebody wants to ask a question, and I'll do my best uh, to, uh, to answer it. By the way, did, did Dr. Simmons have anybody come in here from his communications class? Anybody come in here from him? Okay. It's just... Because he let me know about it. <laughs> Oh, very good. Okay, so communications classes? Uh, history. History classes. Yeah. Well, suddenly I'm really intimidated. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't know that before it started. <laughs> All right, anybody got a question? Give me something. What, what did he do other than just advocate for veterans after the war? Did he go back to teach? Yep. No. So he, he went back, and he actually became the president of Bowdoin College. Um, he, had, he was at Bowdoin College for a while, like about three years. And it's interesting, he actually got himself in trouble with Bowdoin College because he wanted to teach military drill. He felt like the students at Bowdoin should know a lot more about military preparedness because he'd seen it firsthand, and they weren't having it. Like, every, as soon as everybody got out of the Civil War, they were like, yeah, that was then, this is now, we're not, we don't want to talk about it. Um, he tried to get back into... Um, uh, the military at one point, but his health was so bad they didn't, they didn't let him in. So then he became uh, the governor of Maine. He ran for Senate, and at the end, he was like a, like a surveyor. I mean, he lived until he was 85. Um, there's a story also where there was a vote that was occurring, and of course, somebody wasn't count counting the votes quite right, and there was all this hubbub and whatever, 
and he actually um, protected kind of the Supreme Court of Maine, and people were threatening his life. And so he just called everybody out, and he's like, hey, I'll be right here. People have shot at me before. You don't intimidate me. And the whole vote went through, and they, they solved the issue. Um, but yeah, so he, he continued to be, to be active. And, he, and he, he wrote, he went on speaker's tour. He went to like reunions at Gettysburg. You know, he, he did a lot. And he actually toured at one point with an, a fellow um, a Confederate uh, officer as well to, to talk about. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. Okay, so the whole idea uh, behind, behind drill would be clo what's called close order drill is you would have people that would, you would stand right next to them and you had to be able to bring mass, the most amount of people, onto the battlefield at one time. You couldn't have people just sort of show up, you know, as they wanted to. And then what you would do is if you wanted people to execute certain maneuvers, they needed to know what they wanted to do. So for example, the charge down the hill at, at Little Round Top was actually called right wheel forward. Well, if nobody knows drill and he calls out, hey, right wheel forward, and everybody goes, what? And all of a sudden these guys go that way and these guys go this way and now we're not coordinating our, our, our firing. So it was all about delivering the maximum amount of firepower at a given spot. And, and you needed to be dependable on, on being able to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Is that fair to, yep, right? Because like, okay, so again, Gettysburg looks like this, right? 20th Main is right here. These guys are trying to get up here, right? And so if you don't know how to march, you don't arrive there at, at, on time. That's July 2nd. If anybody ever wants to, that's Gettysburg on July 2nd. It's a good drawing. Yes. Do you believe that any of the Confederate leaders could also be called Captain America? Ooh. That's an interesting question. I can that question. Okay. Can restate the question? It's, yeah, do you need me to restate the question there, Nick? I, I, I told you that I was supposed to restate since he's filming this. The question is do I think that any of the uh, Confederate soldiers could be considered Captain America? Um, yes, there are several Confederate soldiers that were allied with their state. They were still in rebellion to the United States, to the Union, okay? But a lot of them, like you could, you could if, depending on how we, how we judge Captain America, right? Um, they had, there were excellent soldiers on, on the South and by the way, the North and the South soldiers knew each other, were good friends. There's a great story about in Gettysburg where Hancock, the General, General Hancock that was at the center, his, his very, very good friend, Lou Wallace, or not Lou Wallace, Lou Armistead, uh, was right there at, at, and they, I mean, they had this massive collision between the two armies. Lou Armistead ends up passing away, but, but dear friends. Um, so yeah, I could, I could probably, at the top of my head, could come up with a couple different Southern arm. Like I, I kind of became, living in Virginia, Stonewall Jackson was kind of an interesting um, study. Um, we could talk about Stonewall Jackson a lot because he was kind of a, uh, a rebel within the rebels, if you will. Did not, um, was not supportive of, uh, was kind of an abolitionist in West Virginia, before there was West Virginia, okay? He was out there, um, thought that people were making bad decisions, but as soon as the Union attacked Virginia, he went to Virginia. The same can be said about me. He was on paper as early as 1829, mm -hmm. stating his opposition to slavery. Yes. And his only connection to slavery is that he was the executor of his father-in-law's will and his father-in-law, a uh, stepson of George Washington, was a slave owner right. and he freed the slaves as fast as he could yeah. legally. Lee is an interesting study because there's been things that have been hung on him that whether, not necessarily deserved, but he was fighting for a cause that was 
um, sort of, well, not sort of, was, 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 was bad from the start. Another question, good question. Mustered in? What does that mean? It means that you're brought into the military. So when they say you're mustered, not like yellow mustard on the sandwich. Oh, that's why I can think of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mustered means that you are called in. That's when you entered the military. So when you say he's mustered in, you're like, before you're mustered in, you're civilian. You're mustered in, you're, you're part, you're in. The Navy uses musters. Yes, the Navy still does. Yeah, so you group up. Did he say that he was mustered in the second time? No, he, he, never, he never left. He, he was at the hospital, um, and he tried to get back in, um, but the Army wouldn't take him back in because he was, his health was so bad from his Petersburg wound that they wouldn't, they wouldn't take him back in. Which, by the way, okay, now we've got to wrap it up, but William Oates, the commander of the 47th Alabama, I think, 15th, 47th, that he faced at Gettysburg, they let him back into the Army. So that was a huge hit to Joshua Chamberlain's pride that his, that his adversary was allowed back in the Army. And he, never, he never went to Cuba for the Spanish-American War. He never went to Cuba or anything, but he was actually brought back into the military as a former Confederate soldier uh, from Alabama. Yes, sir, last question. Yeah, it's not a question. Okay. Right. Uh, this is in World War One. Okay. You can probably guess who that was. It was between uh, two towns, Berlin, the Argonne, and Chechi. Uh, do you remember who that was? I, I just got called out. <laughs> um, I want to. Mm, it's he, he commanded. He was responsible Ray, for the tanks. And well, Patton was there. Um, okay, so so now Patton, we start talking about Patton, we'll be here till 10. Because <laughs> he, he's an interesting cat unto himself, and there's good... If I was to leave anybody with anything out of all of this, okay, is this. These are men. They have good. They have bad. No one's perfect this side of heaven. He, Joshua Chamberlain... I probably engaged in a little hero worship a little bit there because I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by what he did. But he still had his own problems, okay? Patton's the same way. Good, bad, just like all of us. We have our good things and we have our bad things, right? You try to keep your bad things and, and try to make, make those smaller and, and, and make your big, good things better. Um, and I do think out of all of this, if I was to wrap this up, is that inside all of us, we have a need or a desire to sort of resonate with that hero. That hero. Um, and, and that hero, there, there's a hero for all of us that we, that we try to find uh, out there. In, on the human side, they're always going to fall short. Right? I have my personal hero in the Lord. So... That's my, that's, my, uh, that's my witness, um, and, and that's what resonates for me. But, but men will always have a good and a, and a bad. So, all right. That's it. We're 10 minutes over. I will hang out here for a little bit. If somebody wants to see a bayonet...